today on Treasure Hunting America. We'll find out what the hobby of flying and treasure hunting have in common. We would look up to see where all the old houses were. When you fly over them and look down, you can see the outline either of some trees or an old foundation. And then we use that then as markers on where to go and how to dig up coins and look for coins. Then we'll visit with Jim Roper, who's found more than 170,000 coins. I call it a banking activity because other people deposit and I withdraw. And finally, Scott Seville will share how to find the best treasure hunting sites. Back before the turn of the century, a church social was something that people looked forward to for long periods of time, and people would come from miles around. They're going to lose things, and uh, we're here to find them. All coming up on Treasure Hunting America. Hello and welcome to another episode of Treasure Hunting America. I'm your host, Mark Hendricks. For the next half hour, we'll share some amazing stories of everyday treasure hunters across the country discovering vast antiquities and caches of yesteryear. Our first story takes us to Marysville, California. It's here that Vernon Mack combines his love of flying and treasure hunting. Well, the way I got into metal detecting is my brother kind of uh, for his Christmas present back in the early 80s, a uh, little 4,000 whites, and he brought it over to my folks' place, and he says, I want to show you what I got here. So I said, wow. I said, what is it doing? He says, it's a metal detector. And I said, well, let's go. So we went down this park, and it was getting toward the evening, and we just dug up one quarter after another. I said, I can't believe this. I said, where do you get these at? From that on, I just uh, developed uh, the habit, learned how to do it, and through trial and error, began to get involved in metal detecting, and it's just been a great sport. After a while, you become addicted to it, and every time you dug something up out of the ground, you simply didn't know what it was going to be. It just absolutely is just like opening a Christmas present every day of the year. Jim lives in California's rich Sacramento Valley, just outside of Marysville. This can be a great place to hunt for special coins and relics relating to the California Gold Rush. The reason that I like to hunt around Marysville and Yuba City area is that uh, the, the fork of the river between the Yuba and the Feather River is where all the old boats come up and carried the miners up to the jumping off place. Also known as California's oldest little city, Marysville was incorporated in 1850. Its growth was due to the thousands of gold miners who made their way up the Yuba and Feather Rivers to hunt for their life's fortunes in the Sierra foothills. Anticipated as the New York of the Pacific, Marysville didn't quite reach the mega city status, but it's still a great place for hunting for artifacts left behind by the 49ers. And they were just countless ends of mule trails and wagons and all kinds of things. In the process, they lost a lot of things in this area. And so it's an old town with a rich history of old things in it. There, it looks like a, a dime. It says two inches deep. Let's see what we got here. Yeah, it's in there. Let's see what we got here. There it is, right there. Nice little silver dime. That's what it's all about. That's what you enjoy doing. When you dig in the ground, you never know what you're gonna find. Because he's well known in the area, Jim sometimes gets called in on some unusual hunting assignments. We have a historical museum here in Marysville, and I continue to get calls for to donate my time to find casket markers down there. It's quite involved. You have to read, uh, you have to, wherever you find the marker, you have to identify the, where it's at and then catalog it. So it kind of takes the fun out of metal detecting, although it is a volunteer for the, the, uh, the graveyard down there. 
When we return, Jim Mack will share about hunting after artifacts left by Chinese railroad workers and tell how his love of flying and treasure hunting come together. I've taken guys out that have bought metal detectors and we'll go along and pick up probably 10 or 15 coins in a matter of 30 minutes or less and they just can't believe that there's so many things that have been lost that they, they try to accuse me of planting the coins, which I don't do. I tell them I got better things to do than plant coins. And uh, once they get the hang of it, they just become hooked. They eat, sleep, and talk metal detecting. As a treasure hunter, Jim is always looking for new adventure and hunting opportunities. Uh, there's a network of guys that I associate with and we all like to metal detect and there's uh, one in particular and right now we're researching uh, the, the railroads that are going across the Sierra Pacific and he's looking up where the old miners used to camp, not miners, but the construction workers. They were Chinese construction workers over the Sierra Pacific and they were just thousands of them up there and they all got paid a small portion but it's all in gold coins as I understand. It wasn't very much, it was like a dollar a day or two dollars a day, it was a very low nomination but the, the number of possibilities by being so many people working on that railroad, somebody lost something. Some of the silver coins I'm real proud of is the half dollars I've dug up and uh, over the years I got almost a complete collection of them here of the different generations starting with the Kennedy half dollar and then working down to the Franklin half dollar the walking Liberty half dollar and the barber half dollar and then the proudest one here is uh, an, uh, let's see it's 1876 seeded half dollar I found and that's the year that uh, Custer's last stand was in, is 1876, so it's quite significant. On the oldest one, I can tell you this one here was down on 12th Street in Marysville, and uh, they were doing a parking lot and getting ready to blacktop it the next day. I went down there that night right at dusk, and I went over it with my metal detector, and uh, I got a nice reading, and I kicked it with the toe of my shoe, and it come out of the ground. That's how close they were when they scraped the lot. But it was just, a, it was just really a thrill to find something that was back in the 1800s and being so old like that, especially around Marysville when it was only incorporated in 1853. Jim's love of treasure hunting has always combined with his love for flying. Having his own plane gives him quite the advantage in scoping out new sites. One of the things that I have is I've got a, a, a Mooney that I fly in. Uh, I used to have a Cessna and I used it to great advantage while I metal detect. And the secret is, as we go down and get a state map, down at uh, the recording and we would look up to see where all the old houses were and uh, in doing that the houses are long gone by now but when you fly over them and look down you can see the outline either of some trees or an old foundation or uh, some kind of a driveway or something and then we use that then as markers on where to go and how to dig up coins and look for coins. We went down to uh, Woodland and I found uh, probably about three silver dimes and one um, Barber Dime, I think it was. So we had success there, uh, and it was just a lot of fun. What we're doing is not only the love of flying, but the love of metal detecting, and it gives me an opportunity to do both of them at the same time. Our next treasure hunter is Jim Roper of Medford, Oregon. Over the past 30 years, he's found more than 175,000 coins, and there's no end in sight. We have seven children and I wanted to devise activities that I could do with them together. And this turned out to be a good choice. I found uh, about $8,000 so far. Well, it doesn't work out on an hourly basis. <laughs> but you do come home with something each time, usually a pocket full of change. In some cases, it could be 10 or $20, depending upon how lucky you are that day but it's enough to keep me interested and keep me going. It's a penny and you can't find any trace of my recovering it. Metal detecting is something that really isn't for everybody. It requires a great deal of patience and perseverance and a lot of people uh, really don't have that much. They're not cut out for it. The idea is to keep your search coil low and parallel to the ground and not to swing happy faces like this because here you're way above the ground. 
Keep the search coil parallel to the ground and low. Not too fast. A lot of people are even more impatient than I am and they hunt in a random pattern here and there and everywhere. I don't do that. If I have an area which I feel is good, like a soccer field, I hunt it just like you would mow the grass. Back and forth, back and forth. I essentially hunt the whole field. I'm not saying I find all the coins, but I find many, many, many times more than you would going at random like a drunken sailor. So that's, that's my secret to success. When we return, Jim Roper will share some humorous stories while hunting and show us some of his best finds. Over the years, Jim has been approached and asked some pretty humorous questions about metal detecting. Hunting uh, on the Oregon coast, I was accosted by a young boy who said, will that thing find clams? <laughs> I was laughing so hard I couldn't answer. I've had people come up to me and put coins in my coin apron because I was the poor, destitute man that has to earn his dinner picking up coins out of the grass. You never know what they'll ask next. The dumbest thing they ask is, am I finding anything? Because metal detectors are designed to find metal and the ground is full of metal and you will always find something every, every time you turn it on. The intelligent question would be, have you found anything good? This is called a Morgan dollar. I found this at a high school on a baseball field right under shortstop. This is a peace dollar. I found this in a schoolyard. And this one's very interesting because it looks just like a silver dollar. It's the same size, it's 90% silver, but it's a 1935 coin from Cuba, one peso. And then this one over here is called a barber half. And I found this in a remote town in Northern California in a city park. Having hunted in more than 33 states, Jim is always ready for an adventure even if it means hunting in his neighbor's backyard. When we go to visit friends, I ask them if I, they can hunt, I can hunt their yard, and they say, oh, sure, and I take advantage of that, and oftentimes find silver coins doing it. People are very interested to see what you find. I went to a friend's house, and I found about six sets of keys. He told me that he, nobody else had lived in that house besides him, and he doesn't remember ever losing any keys. Jim's greatest pleasure in this hobby is getting a lot of exercise in the outdoors. My wife accuses me of not exercising when I'm metal detecting, but on one occasion, I found 839 coins in one day. That was 839 deep knee bends in one day. I was over 65 years old at the time, and I guarantee that was exercise. Before he goes on that last hunt, Jim Roper has some big goals. He wants to find more than 200,000 coins and also strike gold. Gold is usually hard to detect and small gold coins can be misidentified as trash many times and not retrieved. But I would be very happy to find a real gold coin. How about a double eagle, $20 gold piece? That would be the ultimate for me. Or a half a dozen of them. Jim's greatest hopes and dreams are that the treasure hunting myths are spread far and wide. Myth number one, that nobody loses anything. Myth number two, that if they did lose it, there's no way you could find it. And I'm hoping that those two myths can be perpetuated. And in addition to that, I hope that the schools get more money for more upside down bars. Scott Seville was born to find treasure. He began coin collecting as a boy and now hunts all over the Pacific Northwest. His hobbies of coin collecting and metal detecting go hand in hand and he's constantly on the lookout for new places to hunt. I got started metal detecting as a kid. Uh, my parents, they were into antiques and we were in, lived in northwestern Montana. Uh, we were surrounded by history 
and uh, I took an interest to coins. And there are no coin shops in Montana. So I ended up purchasing a metal detector on the ground. It turned out to be a great place to, to metal detect. You could just see Western cowboys there if you just look close enough. And being surrounded by that kind of environment, it is pretty easy to stay interested in your past. You can call it treasure hunt, hunting, but it's fishing. And you just get out there and fish in the dirt. You never know what your day is going to be like. Some, sometimes uh, you get hungry and wet and you don't find a thing. Other days, you're out for two hours and you come back with treasures that are just funner than heck. This here I found along a riverbank. Uh, it's a, uh, a pocket watch and the crystal is still intact. What's neat about hunting underneath a forest canopy is the stuff doesn't sink into the ground and there's very little build on top of it. So stuff can be lost 100 years ago and it's underneath an inch of leaves. Irradiation, we, historically we think of that as a bad thing. But back in the 1940s and 50s, irradiation meant high tech, like, like we use the word digital. It was irradiated at uh, let's see, the Museum of Atomic Energy. My best find, as far as hi historically, uh, is a watch fob. Uh, it says, Enumclaw Dairy Carnival, 1913. And it has a cow. And then on the back, uh, it says, an event in which we proclaim our superiority as a dairy producing section. I mean, the language is so cool. And uh, again, who lost this? I found it, and uh, it's a part of me. When we return, Scott will take us into the Cascade foothills to search for artifacts and coins in Washington's old coal mining areas. Thirty-five miles east of Seattle lies a beautiful area in the foothills of Mount Rainier. You couldn't tell it now, but in the 1880s, this area was a top coal producer for the Pacific Northwest, with thousands of people residing in the valley. It's here that Scott Seville lives and hunts for artifacts and coins left almost a hundred years ago. A lot of times the best metal detecting spots are between places. The land we live on, all of it was li lived on just as extensively as people live today. They ran through the woods, walked down the hillsides, walked along the creek banks. And those kind of places are overlooked a lot. And some of the most significant finds uh, are found in those kind of spots. Okay, I'm getting a signal that is showing good high numbers. 85, 90, 86, 75. Right there, I've shrunk that field down to where all I'm doing is finding the center of the object. Right there is the center, so right in the middle of that hole, the center of the search coil. Okay, uh, we're going to dig. This uh, shows promise. So we'll see here. I'm doing a flap that you peel back, and you always want to do a flap, because then the grass can be put back and there will still be root uh, structure to feed moisture. Here it's a field, you don't have to worry about it, but it's a good ha habit to get into so when you're doing a nice lawn, you don't end up with dead spots or you, you minimize the, uh, the effect. Okay, pull out the, the bullseye. It's a dime. It's a mercury dime. Nineteen twenty. That's a good find. That's a good find. When you find coins that have been in the ground for a long time, they tend to get a whitish, powdery kind of look because uh, they're they're ninety percent silver and ten percent co copper. Well, the ground salts and stuff they leach the copper out of the surface of the coin, and you end up with more of a white, powdery-looking kind of coin. And uh, I don't think. If it was a 1921, that's a rare date. So we're one year off from, from it being a rare date. But that's a good find. It's a good find. It's a memory. Besides being an avid treasure hunter, Scott's other hobby is coin collecting. 
This second hobby has given him insight into preserving the value of what he finds in the ground. You have to really watch out about scratching coins. Uh, coin collecting is, has reached the point now to where people look at coins underneath intense magnification. And you can literally take thousands of dollars off a coin by rubbing a dirty coin to read the date. Uh, it's super important to rinse those coins in water and put them in a cotton ball container. Wait till you get home to check the date. Don't be scrubbing it, don't clean them. Collectors look at clean coins and they shriek back in horror of something bright and shiny. There's a big difference between mint luster and bright and shiny. Bright and shiny is a scary thing. The benefits of treasure hunting for Scott Seville go way beyond finding coins and jewelry. His time in the outdoors provides a way for him to relax and enjoy touching the past. When you find a coin or an artifact, uh, especially about your local history, that you know about uh, the community, you know the people, you kind of have a general feel of how the town developed. Uh, and then you find a part of that history, and especially when things are grouped together. Uh, it feels like you're reaching back in time and making a connection with someone back then. And you know, you're, you are truly the next person to touch that after the person who lost it. And so it it's sound, might sound kind of corny, but I don't care. It's totally cool. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Treasure Hunting America. Be sure to join us next time for more stories of everyday treasure hunters all across the country. Until next time, I'm Mark Hendricks. Happy hunting. Treasure Hunting America is sponsored by White's Electronics, manufacturers of the world's finest metal detectors. For over 50 years, White's has been building metal detectors in the USA for treasure hunters around the world. For more information, visit their website or call the number on your screen.